Okay, let me finish. Okay. Um, I thank you, everybody, for joining this afternoon. I'm going to talk about something that uh, I've got interested in about 18 months ago and have been working on it uh, you know, pretty steadily since that time. But um, the title is the Airmail Envelope Study Project. Short biography of myself, because I don't know very many of you. Uh, I spent the last 10 years of my career as a software project manager. My wife and I both retired in March of 2019. I started collecting stamps in 1959 with an album from my father and my parents bought some um, approvals uh, for me at the time to help me. I kind of dropped out of stamp collecting during when I went to school and, and as I was raising my family and I resumed collecting in 1977. Currently, I collect worldwide prior to 1950 with a focus on Latin America. I also collect Switzerland. Switzerland is the only country that I collect new issues for. Um, and I, airmail envelopes. And then just kind of anything else that looks interesting. I have a lot of different kinds of things in my collection. Um, so, you know, that are kind of hard to classify. So what we're going to talk about is kind of first what sparked my interest in this subject then an overview of what I've been doing. Then we'll talk about uh, the borders around the envelopes, the printed etiquettes. Uh, I've got some examples of some of the better looking ones, uh, uh, some humor, and then uh, any questions. I have some questions for you, and then I'm sure you'll have some questions for me. So what sparked my interest is I went to the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, which is in Denver, and they have tubs of covers, just random cubs of covers that are sorted by country only, nothing beyond that. And I picked up some, some Mexico covers, uh, looking to enhance my uh, collection with, you know, covers uh, with airmail stamps and other stamps as well uh, before 1950. So I picked up these, actually a couple of these covers that I'm showing on the first trip. And then when I got home, I got to looking at the envelopes closer and I saw this etiquette here. And then I looked closer and there's a, another one that looks the same, but yet it's different. And as philatelists, we spend a lot of our time looking at those differences between things. So. This kind of got me to thinking about, well, wait a minute, what else is out there that might be you know, interesting? So I went back uh, my next trip, picked up some more. Uh, these are a little lighter, so they're, they're strictly for my airmail envelopes uh, collection. But you can see the variety of things that are, are, have been used in Mexico to uh, spice up the looks of the envelopes. And besides these uh, that I'm showing, there's I probably got, I don't know, 15 more different styles um, from Mexico. So I also picked up some from around the world. Um, the top left is a cover from Angola and then one from Argentina and uh, one from Yugoslavia. And then finally one from the Belgian Congo, all different, all you know, airmail envelopes intended to be used uh, for airmail, um, just with different looks and feels to them. So this is one cover that I picked up from from Bolivia. Uh, it's in kind of rough shape, but it was interesting in that it had a a different style of border and etiquette. Um, it also happens to be censored, uh, which wasn't really why I bought it, but. Uh, it was, you know, it's interesting for that fact as well. So what is it that I'm looking at? So I'm trying to investigate the different types of envelopes that were used specifically for airmail from around the world. Okay. The requirements to be included is it must have some sort of border markings to indicate airmail or some sort of printed airmail etiquette, uh, some sort of words or symbols that indicate that this should go by air 
not by ground. Um, I require one or both um, of those on an envelope. Uh, by far, the most of my envelopes have both, but some only have one or the other. And then I wanted to devise some sort of a numbering system. Again, as philatelists, we're, we're fascinated by, by numbering and, and how to catalog and organize things. What I've excluded from my study so far is env envelopes that only have etiquette stickers, you know, the, the stickers that you can put on a regular envelope and, and then supposedly it'll go by air. Um, envelopes with hand or typewritten etiquette markings. There's a fair number of those out there. Official postal stationery, um, as uh, you know, those are cataloged elsewhere and I just wanted to exclude them. And then I, I have not made any kind of financial evaluation on rarity or desirability. My sample size is, is far too small to make that kind of, of uh, evaluation. Maybe at some point uh, I might, but I, I doubt I'll ever do that. So some of the terms that I've used, and, and these are arbitrarily decided by me, um, basically. I've gotten some input from the Latin group here in Denver. Um, but a printed etiquette is anyway text, some sort of text or symbols that indicate the envelope should be handled and transferred by air. Okay. Um, I couldn't think of anything else, so I, I settled on etiquette. Um, I get some pushback, and one of the things that I will want your input on is, is there a better term for this? But right now, I'm, I talk about printed etiquettes as ways of indicating airmail. The other thing I look for <clears throat> are border markings. Here's a very typical uh, red and blue chevron marking. Um, and then chevrons or parallelograms. Now, I call these chevrons. Technically, from a math point of standpoint, they are parallelograms. The problem is, is I can't spell parallelograms, and, and all of my writing would be full of little red squiggly lines. So uh, I settled on chevrons um, just as an as a easier way of calling out this type of, of border markings. Okay, so just a simple envelope. You know, you can see the border around the four sides, and you can see the very simple airmail etiquette, printed etiquette on the cover. So a few statistics. Uh, so far, I started this in March of 2019, so about 18 months ago or so. I currently have cataloged uh, 1,380 different envelopes. I have identified 750 printed etiquette styles and that every time i get uh, a new set of envelopes i find more um, i have identified 200 different border styles and occasionally i'll find a new one of those uh, but not very often i try to get at least two copies of each envelope uh, sometimes uh, something might be hidden either by the stamps or by markings on the envelope or something. So I try to get two so that I can make sure that I have everything identified on an envelope. And I have devised a preliminary uh, numbering system that I'm using in my spreadsheet to categorize uh, the envelopes. And this is similar to the one used by the Airmail Etiquette Catalog. The Airmail Etiquette Catalog are the stickers. They have a catalog with thousands of those in them as well. It's similar, but not the same. So my proposed numbering system is to talk about the border details first and then the printed etiquette details. So I've divided each into three sets of numbers. Um, two numbers followed by a period, followed by two more, followed by three. If one of the other is missing, then that section becomes zero, zero, zero to keep my, my uh, ordering system in intact. 
So I maintain a spreadsheet that I'm cataloging these, these things with. And what some of the other stuff that I track, I track the date that the envelope was used as just an indication of what general era it came from. And here's a nice Swiss postmark. Uh, Swiss used a nice steel die for their post care canceller, so it leaves a nice impression um, on the cancel. Unlike this impression, that is really not readable. When I get one of these that I can't read, then I, I look either at the enclosure, if there happens to be one for a date, or sometimes their postal service is really nice and does a nice, uh, in this case, a back stamp as this was a registered cover. Uh, but a lot of times I just can't read the postmark, so then I kind of have to judge its usage by the stamps that were used. Uh, I also track the country and the stamp IDs. I thought initially the country would be a useful thing to keep track of, but after I've done this now for a while, I really don't think, I think the, the envelopes migrated around the world uh, as I see very similar envelopes used all over the world. So I don't know that the country does me much good. And the stamp IDs again are only used basically to determine the period where the, the uh, when the envelope was used. Also keep track of where the etiquette is located, the printed etiquette. I've uh, divided the, each envelope into nine quadrants and then kind of classify them that way. This one, the airmail etiquette would be in the middle right quadrant. Um, okay, so here's the envelope with the in an upper upper left. And then finally one in the lower left. I have found etiquettes in all nine quadrants, um, including the uh, the upper right. Uh, and then some go all the way across the envelope, again, in various locations. OK, I also keep track of the size of the etiquettes. And I'll talk touch on that a little bit more later. But here's a, a ruler that I got. Um, it's an L-shaped ruler that I use to measure the size of the etiquettes um, so that I can keep track of that. Um, I also keep track of manufacturing information if the envelope has it. Not all the envelopes include any kind of indicator of the manufacturer, but some do. Um, and those I keep track of that stuff. So here's a simple ABC with an airplane. Once the main Denver Museum reopens, and I could get into their research department, they should have books that would allow me to take this kind of symbol and locate a company that manufactured it, that used it as their symbol. So I'm hoping that uh, a lot of these things I can do further research and identify the actual manufacturers of the envelopes. Okay, here's another envelope. Um, this is the inside of one um, with a nice airmail over the mountains. Uh, this one was manufactured by a company named Rockmont, which had at least a plant here in Denver when I moved here in, in 1980. Uh, they, were, they had a plant located right off of the interstate. So every time I would go into Denver and go home, I would see it. Um, didn't pay much attention to it at the time. Eight or ten years later, they they must have sold it because then the, the name of the building changed to Mail Well Envelope Company. And then a few years later, um, they tore that whole thing building down and built condominiums. So now it's condominiums on the site of the uh, Airmail Envelope Company. Um, the sad thing about the condominiums is those that face the west, you think would face the mountains. Actually, you look out over the interstate. So, you know, kind of wonder about their, their scenery choice, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. So here's one that came off of a Swiss cover, um, the polar view of the world. I mean, it just why they would put this on the inside and not the outside, I don't know. It's just uh, uh, fascinating to me why they did some of these things. I also keep images of each of the envelopes. I keep the front of every envelope, back of 
envelopes that have information on it that um, uh, is useful, either back stamps or other kinds of stuff um, as well. So that I track all of these in a spreadsheet um, for each envelope that I that I inventory. So we'll talk about borders first, um, or the frames around the envelope. One of the members of the Latin group was a printer by trade. And I don't know how long he spent in the printing business, but it was probably 50 years. But he told me that these really, I used to call them edge markings. And he says, no, 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 no. If you went and ordered them, they would be called borders. So I've changed to borders now for the markings around the edge of the envelopes. And these borders can be on either one side, two side, three sides, or all four sides. Generally all four, but I have some that are, you know, one or two sides as well. So the numbering scheme that I have come up with, okay, again, three sets of numbers. The first two numbers indicate the style. I've divided the uh, edge markings into four different styles as a overall uh, um, category for each type, okay? The middle two numbers are the colors that are used in the, in the border. And then the last three numbers are the border types or the subdivision of the, bo the borders. So we'll, we'll talk about each of those. So the first one is chevrons or by far the most common type of edge marking that I've run across and they are number ones. There are some with bars um, around the edges. There are some with fancy cancels. This is an example of one of them that, uh, you know, of a fancy cancel. And then finally, there are ones that just have lines around the, the edge of the envelope. So these are the four styles that I've break, broken it down into. I'm considering adding a fifth for event cover borders. Um, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, in at least in the US, and I know most countries as well, there was a thousands of airmail events that people generated covers for. Some of those were printed, actual printed covers, not just the rubber caches. Um, and I'm thinking of basically separating those out into a fifth category, but that's still in progress. So this is a cover with a fancy, nice fancy uh, border around two sides of it uh, with a nice fancy printed etiquette to match with the lightning bolt. This particular cover happened to be from my future father-in-law um, writing back to his father during the war. Uh, he was a prolific writer, um, and I've got a lot of envelopes from him back to his family, to his wife and his parents during the war. Um, and he he used this this style of of envelope quite quite a bit. I think they must have been made available to the servicemen somehow. But like I said, this is a nice uh, nice pretty cover that that I really like and have a nice personal connection with. So some statistics, the nice thing about Excel, is, as I'm sure most of you know, is that it's wonderful when you want to count things. So of the 1,380 envelopes that are currently in it, uh, 932 of them have Chevron border markings, or 67%. Of those 932, 729 are red and blue. 69 of them are blue, just blue, 44 are red and green, and then the rest are other colors, as you'll, as you'll see here in a moment. 251 of them don't have any edge markings at all. 24 of them have bars of some sort, 102 have fancies, and 48 have lines. Um, and if I add a fifth category, uh, that I only have a few of those as I haven't spent a lot of time working on them. Uh, the next group of numbers, the center two numbers, are colors. These are 
the colors that I have identified so far, uh, 18 different, 19 different if you count the zero, um, red and blue obviously being the most popular, but uh, there's a myriad of colors. I generally do not consider the envelope as part of the color. Um, so red and, you know, so anyway, but I generally don't. But these are the colors that I've identified um, as existing out there so far. And here's some, some samples of those, the red and the blue, uh, blue and yellow, a red, yellow, red, and, a, and uh, a pink. And this is really a pink. It's not a red, it's a pink, which surprised me when I ran across it. But this one, I, I can call it pink and white because the white is actually printed uh, as part of the etiquette. It's not the envelope color like on the rest of them. And then finally, a, a tricolored one, uh, a red, yellow, and black. So that's just a sampling of, of the colors that, that I've encountered so far. So the third group of numbers is the type or kind of the, um, well, the type is what I'm calling them. So these all are chevrons classified as chevrons, and you can see the different styles, you know, the, the common, you know, right-leaning chevron up here, one with wider chevrons and much narrower spaces, uh, chevrons that is split in the middle and go all each direction, a couple of those, different styles again. Some are, have the same color twice, then a space, then the same color again. Um, and then these are long, narrow ones, but again, it's just, it's a distinctly different uh, marking from, from the others. So that's why I've got the, the uh, tight markings. Why red and blue? Why did that become so, so prominent around the world? In August, on August 1st of 1928, the US Post Office Department, uh, as it was then called, issued a directive and they, officially approved, but didn't require how they manage that. I'm not quite sure, but you know, they approved two styles, but didn't require anything. So the first type they, they approved was a red and blue, either diamonds, lozenges, or parallelograms. Okay. And the second type is a red and blue horizontal stripes. So diamonds, and lozenges are, if you look up lozenges, they're defined as diamonds. So they're, to me, they're the same thing. Um, very little use. And then the parallelograms is what uh, is predominant. So here is the type A that they approved. This is an actual picture from the, the post office directive. Okay, here's an example of an envelope that was used very shortly after that couple of few, just a few months afterwards. And in this particular case, it's got a statement on the back that this envelope was approved for airmail only use. Okay, so this was what they produced to meet that requirement. Then the other type that they approved was this, you know, red and blue stripes. Okay, so here's an example of what they intended to, to have produced from the directive. And here's an example of an envelope that meets that directive. Um, this one happens to have a picture of Lindbergh on it. Uh, I kind of wish this envelope had been used, but it hasn't, but it, it still is an interesting envelope uh, to me. Um, why are we showing this again? Oh, here's that. Okay. And then this is another example of that same type of red and blue lines across it. This one, they put the etiquette in the red line and they added a, another flying winged etiquette for some reason. Also in this directive, it directed a rate change happen. Uh, went, went from 10 cents per half ounce to five cents per half ounce. And that required a new stamp be issued. So out came the five cent 
red and blue beacon stamp, as it's known, and it was widely used after that. So what other countries had preferences? And there were a few. Brazil used a lot of yellow and green. Mexico used a lot of red and green. Argentina used blue, and they predominantly only had their airmail etiquettes in the corners. And then Sweden used a lot of blue and yellow. Most countries eventually migrated to red and blue, and most of the recent ones in the last 20 years or 30 years have been red and blue. So in summary on the, on the borders, there's four styles that I've identified. Um, 18, actually 19 color combinations, and I've identified 220 different subtypes of the border markings. And here's a, another different style that I've seen. So here's an envelope from Peru down to Buenos Aires with just lines around the, the outside. Um, it does have the Via Aria etiquette in the upper corner. And here's another cover from uh, Venezuela, uh, again that down to Argentina, Buenos Aires. This one, although it has the airplanes and the red and blue uh, kind of chevrons joining them together, uh, doesn't anywhere say on it that it is, you know, for airmail. I guess the uh, uh, postal service was supposed to assume it was airmail based on the airplanes and the stamps that were used. In this case, they did use airmail stamps. And I appreciate that. Uh, so now moving on to the printed airmail etiquettes. And these are words or symbols that specify that the sender wanted the envelope to be transferred by air through either all of its journey or some portion of its journey. So again, I've got the same similar numbering system, three sets of, of numbers. The first two indicate the style of the etiquette, and I've identified 10 different styles. Second is the language um, that's used on the, on the etiquette. And then the last is the type. And this is where I have, like I said, 750 and counting of these different etiquette types. So the style details, again, I've, I've, I've identified 10, and they're the first section. So the first one we're going to look at is just text only or text with a very simple line, nothing else. I've identified 182 different types of these, either different wording, different fonts, uh, different, uh, just different types of, of uh, words that say airmail okay then the second type or style is text inside a box and here's two examples of those i have identified 176 different types of text in boxes and this is just text okay i've got 32 different types of text in boxes with some sort of emblem the emblem on the left is by far the most uh, predominant one, uh, the little winged thing. But there's also, as the one on the right shows, an envelope. There's some other uh, different types, of which are just a few of. But that's, you know, text in a box with some sort of emblem. The next is text with some sort of wings. Um, and I've identified 40 different types. Here's two. Um, the one on the left has airmail in four different languages. Um, the one on the right has it in two. Four is the most of any of the languages that I've run across. I haven't seen any with more than that. This, the fifth type is the etiquette or the text in a corner. And here are two different types uh, one with just the arrow coming out of the corner, and then the second one. Um, with the text in the corner, uh, 
as shown. And I've got 37 different types of those. Now, sometimes the printers kind of took these ideas and kind of went a little overboard. Okay, now here's technically would be text in the corner of a cover from Latvia, um, used in 1924. But the printer kind of took the idea of the edit and splashed it across the entire envelope so bold that there's really no place to put the stamps and there's really not a good place to put the address. So they kind of you know, took a good idea and kind of went uh, overboard with it. Uh, this one happens to be going, went to Geneva and there's a rubber stamp on it um, applied by the Swiss. I'm, I'm fairly certain that they wanted it to go by railway post office you know, once it got to Switzerland, because in this time, I don't think there was any in regular internal Swiss airmail of any sort. So back to the different styles, um, text with an airplane. So the text can be either with an airplane shown or inside of an airplane, either way, kind of falls into this category. And I've got 73 different examples of, of this type. The text box with an airplane, um, you know, shown here, there's 26 different types of these. And then text with a bird or some sort of flying animal. So here's a, a you know, a little stylized bird. Here's a, a flying pegasus of some sort. And again, I've identified 33 different types of these. The next type is text that extends across the entire length of the envelope. Okay, and here's two examples. Uh, this may be either horizontal or vertical. And I've, I've identified 98 different types of, of this type of markings. And then finally, um, I've just got a miscellaneous classification of just things that don't seem to fit anywhere else. The one on the left, is really three birds, but has no text on it. And the one on the right uh, has an emblem that could be a bird, could be a plane, could be who knows. But so it kind of falls in the miscellaneous category. Okay, and I've got 47 different uh, types identified in that category. Okay, so the language details are this is the center section of the number. And this is used to identify the either the first line reading left to right, top to bottom, or the most predominant, or yeah, first line reading left to right, top to bottom. It may not be the most predominant language on the etiquette, okay? Here's the different languages that I've identified. So far, and again, I'm you know you know just the different languages that I've identified, subdivided them into. Here's an example of, of one that goes across the entire envelope, and this one highlights that it's you know the via airmail parivon is the most dominant um, printing on on the uh, etiquette. But uh, initially, I had classified it as an airmail. But when I was doing this presentation, putting this presentation together, I realized that, wait a minute, there's actually a Chinese over here on the left that, uh, although my translator won't translate it, I'm assuming that it says airmail somehow. So uh, I, got, I got kind of, you know, red-faced a little bit about that, that I mis missed that completely. So it, it may not, again, my point is it may not be the predominant marking on the etiquette, but it's the one that is, is to the left or top, either way. Okay, so here's a, a, a example of a cover um, from Brazil to, to Germany, um, flown during, during 1932. Uh, and we believe um, that it actually went by Zeppelin. I have not had a chance to research the actual flight number once again once the library opens back up and i can get to the research i will look up what flight this is but based on the postage uh, we kind of assume that it did in fact go by 
Zeppelin across the Atlantic back to Germany. And this has a, you know, via Condor etiquette marking along the bottom. So the, the summary of the, or no, the third, third is the types. Um, the third section is the types. Currently there's 735 different ones I've identified. Okay, and here's an example of just airmail, either just airmail or via airmail or by airmail, but just the marking that's basically um, says airmail. The different, these are four different types of the hundred and some that I've identified. Um, and you can see the different fonts. Some are italicized, some are bold, some are, uh, these happen to be all caps, but some of them are uh, caps in small letters. And just, again, just different styles of, of the same basic thing. Uh, here's some examples of etiquettes with wings. Um, you can see on the upper upper two, the wings are kind of, they really kind of look like wings. Um, the bottom two are much more stylized. In fact, the one on the bottom left is really stylized to where, you know, it's kind of only wings in your imagination. But when I saw this etiquette, okay, I got to, something kept tickling my mind that I've seen this somewhere else. And where else have I seen this style of, of the object? Well, it turns out they recently built a hotel attached to the new airport here in Denver. And lo and behold, I swear that the designer, the architect, went back and must have had some philatelic influence and seen that etiquette or something. But uh, to me, this looks just like, you know, the etiquette only brought in a hotel. So just fascinating to me that the, you know, the reach of Latley sometimes. Variations in sizes of the printed etiquettes. This etiquette, this via airmail, is the most common type used, okay, um, by far. And I have found it in sizes ranging from two millimeters high by 27 wide, all the way up to five by 45. At one point I was trying to subdivide them in making each one a different type, and then that got to be just too cumbersome. So I pulled back from that idea and basically called them all type 111, but then I track the size as, as another uh, parameter in my spreadsheet. Um, but I'm so I, I guess I'm I'm surprised at the variety of sizes that are out there in a seemingly, you know, simple kind of etiquette. Okay, so here's the com, com, uh, cover from Honduras. Uh, I was I was in as just it, it struck me as being a, a fascinating cover. Um, once I got it investigating a little farther, I figured out that the, they had used the Honduran flag as the blue uh, stripe in their border. So it really kind of uh, made it interesting to me. And then further, I flipped it over, and lo and behold, they had printed a map of Honduras on the back. So somebody took a lot of time to, you know, to design it to figure out how to integrate the flag into the design and as well as print the, uh, the map on the back. So interesting cover. Another interesting cover, this one from Uruguay. Um, it's got a fancy border with the little kind of very stylized airplanes. Look like they're flying over the ocean, um, but it's got a uh, outline of South America with Uruguay highlighted in red. Um, and then this one also tickles my fancy is in that it's a stamp on stamp motif on a stamp. So, you know, kind of kind of hits me for in two different ways. This is a cover. It's a first day cover of a Panamanian C10. The printer of the envelope, the designer and the copywriter of the envelope was a gentleman by the name of A.C. Rosler, who worked out of New Jersey. Um, he sold these envelopes, so you could buy these and use these yourself. 
And there are a lot of them that were used for events. Uh, Mr. Rosler was a big promoter of airmail events in the 30s and 40s. Um, you see these envelopes um, for a lot of events. There's a lot of them out there. Um, some of them are addressed to him directly, others are not. But this one, what we figure happened on this one is that he put together these, a bunch of envelopes and sent them down to Panama and had them canceled on the first day and then shipped back to him in another cover because there's no transit markings on it um, at all. And it, it's in very good shape and, you know, he kind of, it's in better shape than most of my, my envelopes from that period. So what we think he did is he probably prepared the covers, shipped them down to Panama, had them canceled, and had them shipped back in another cover. And once he sold it, once he sold the cover, got an order for a cover, he would type the gentleman's name on the cover and then ship it to him. And it had to have been shipped in a separate cover because there's no U.S. postage on it. So it kind of it seems like he went through a lot of work, but. Whatever, that's what he did. Okay, so in summary on the printed etiquettes, okay, there's 10 options for the style and 10 options for the language and over 700 options for the different types. This cover, I threw this cover in um, because I, I received this cover the 1st of August of this year. So. Um, what's that about two and a half months ago I received this cover uh, so some countries the United States hasn't used airmail hasn't had a separate airmail rate um, since 75 or 77 um, they stopped specifying airmail but some countries apparently still do and this one came over from Britain and has a nice selection of stamps on it I wish it had gone through their canceller so I could have got a nice you know, date stamp on it, but not that lucky. So as going through the, now we're going to do a little humor here, or, you know, just some things that people did that I kind of scratched my head over. So the one on the, the upper etiquette, you know, the airplane, and this is actually the way the etiquette looks on the envelope. It, the plane to me is, you know, heading to the ground very fast. I mean, it's just like he's crashing. Um, so I don't know what airline this is, but I don't think that's one I would choose to fly on. Uh, the second one, the bottom one, um, the guy that designed the etiquette was apparently not a nautical engineer, but knew enough, knew enough about it to figure that the wings would sweep at some point. He just happened to get the direction wrong and he swept them forward instead of what eventually happened was sweeping them back. So I just kind of scratch my head at these and say, what were they thinking? The next one is a cover um, where they printed the etiquette exactly the place where the stamps go. And so you can see here, they put the stamp over, over part of the etiquette. Um, so you, again, you got to wonder what the designer was thinking. I mean, he's got a nice airplane border, red and blue airplanes around the border and stuff. Um, but they kind of put the the printed etiquette in the wrong spot. This cover is also interesting. It has a Dominican Republic return address, okay, but it was mailed apparently in Chicago. It's got US postage on it and a Chicago cancel. So I'm assuming somebody must have come up to the States and mailed it. But it was just kind of, kind of interesting to me that, uh, you know, the way that the life that this envelope must have had. And then uh, uh, fake uh, fake airmail covers. Um, these were covers that were intended to buy bulk mailers, and they they had to figure out ways to make their junk mail look more appealing to the recipients. So in this case, they kind of spiced it up, um, trying to make it look like an airmail cover. So it's got the red and the blue chevrons along the top, and it's got a a replica of a Honduran stamp on it. It's got some 
what were supposed to be, I suppose, rubber stamps of various instructions. But what gives it away is it's got a US nonprofit bulk rate stamp on it um, that wouldn't have paid the postage to get it from the airport to the city. So again, they were trying to make it look better. Here's some other examples of envelopes that they were trying to make, you know, look more important to the recipient. You know, you've got urgent emergency on it and reply and stuff. The bottom one even has a, a message to the postmaster that they don't want it to go back to China. <laughs> so it was, if they couldn't deliver it, put it in the trash. But again, more attempts to, uh, to make the covers look more appealing to the recipients. And here's one that I picked up when I first picked it up. I thought, wow, the airplane highlighted in, in red and blue silhouettes. Um, for some start, it's kind of an interesting cover, but it turns out that it's not really an airmail cover. They just happen to um, try to make it look like an airmail cover. The three cent postage, again, wasn't adequate for any airmail at the time. Um, so, again, something else they were trying to to make look more appealing. Okay, so during this search for envelopes, I was given a trash bag that had a thousand, maybe 1500 envelopes in it from one gentleman. Um, this uh, uh, gentleman was a history professor at, at a local university and he and his wife collected stamps. And this one, somebody had ripped off the stamps for whatever reason. And for whatever, I cannot imagine why they did this, but they went ahead and kept the rest of the envelope. And I, this one's intriguing. It's the only one I've ever seen that has bubbles around the edge. And it's got a very nice airmail etiquette. Uh, so if anybody knows anybody that has one of these that's interested in, in selling it, let me know. I've contacted a couple of dealers in in South America, and nobody seems to have any of them uh, handy. So if anybody happens to know of one, uh, I would appreciate appreciate it. Uh, during this pandemic, uh, we've been housebound. So I took the opportunity to soak some stamps off. And in the lots that I got, I got these two clippings uh, that obviously came off of airmail envelopes. Um, so I'm looking for these as well. The top one from Denmark has actual triangles on it. The bottom one is, again, a line of airplanes around the edges. So two more of what I'm looking for that I've seen. Um, so that's it. Um, oh, some questions that, that I need your help on. Uh, terms, chevrons, printed etiquettes, the style type. If any of you have any ideas about terms that would be more appropriate, let me know. I'm also looking for any other post office directives from around the world on envelope designs. And I've contacted a couple of people in South America um, because they seem to, uh, you know, between Brazil and Argentina and Mexico, uh, they seem to have their own unique styles. And I was just curious if there was any sort of directions from the post office and so far i've gotten no response so i'll throw that out to you that if any of you know of any post office directives let me know i would appreciate that or who to contact to maybe find out about that okay so any questions i i need to thank uh dasha metzler um john blower mark silberman Sergio Lugo and, and others, Henry, for giving me the opportunity to present this presentation. Um, I will say that while I was pre preparing the presentation, I found lots of things that I didn't expect, things that I didn't catch the first time around, like the language on that one etiquette, plus a lot of other things. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me um, to put it together and to present it to you. And, and again, I'm looking for feedback. If you, you can either send me an email or you can text me. Either way, um, I'll respond. If you have uh, covers that are unique in some way, 
I'd appreciate a scan of them. Uh, what I would like is a scan of the front and the back. And if you can, if the flaps open and there's some sort of marking, typically the manufacturer marking was on the flap. Uh, but if there's any kind of manufacturer marking, shoot me a scan of that as well. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. Uh, again, right. thank you for attending. Thank you, Gary. Uh -huh. Was a good presentation there. Very good. Any questions for Gary? O algunas preguntas si es que necesito la traducción. Molina. No, no, I do not have any question. I oh. only uh, making applause. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Why do you decide to use a spreadsheet instead of a, of a database for helping you catalog in it? Um, I guess I could have used a database. I have access and I, and I know how to set up a database. Uh, it just Excel was just kind of easier to use. Um, I, at some point I, I should really convert it to a database, but uh, I haven't yet. Yeah, I guess from the, from the Excel, you can export the CVS file and, mm -hmm. right. and read it on the database and should be okay, but yeah. I did, I did make a mistake the other day in that I, I overwrote a bunch of information. And with Excel, I collapsed a bunch of rows and then dragged, you know, information. Well, I wrote it on all the collapsed rows. So I now I'm, I'm trying to cor correct that. So yes, a database would be a good choice, a better choice probably than Excel. Um, and you can do the same, you know, statistical manipulation with a database as you do with Excel. So yes, yes, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'd have to go back and write some geek code, you know, some SQL code. <laughs> Gary, a couple of questions, actually, more huh? more like a comment uh, on the latter part of your presentation, where you have that uh, plane kind of coming down. Uh -huh you know, pointing down. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, I've seen those in Peruvian covers and it refers that they are landing, but I do agree with you because the landing is never in that degree of, right. of you know, plane, uh, planning. Attitude, it has yeah. to be a little bit different, <laughs> but that's what it means to be. That That's one. And the other one with the, what they call it, the border and, and the one with the red and white printed. Typically, my understanding was that s countries used to reflect their flag colors within mm -hmm. them, right? Yeah. And the white and red is, if I'm not mistaken, the one you show that is also from Peru because the Peruvian covers are always like that, red and, and white. Oh, I haven't seen that many Peruvian covers, apparently. Oh, yeah, I, I can send you some some copies of those. But they, yeah, they yeah. printed the white in some cases, and later on, maybe they want to save some money, and they just printed the the red. But the red, right, I've seen right. those, too. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I didn't mention in there, and I should have, uh, by country, I obviously have the most United States covers as a you know, U.S. collector, and, and I think there were probably lots and lots, well, there's thousands of them for sale on eBay alone. But the second country that I have the uh, second number of, of envelopes is Mexico. Mm -hmm. And they are much more variety. Oh, yeah. But they're very, very pretty, in my opinion, a lot of the, the covers from Mexico. Very creative with all the kind of things you're looking for. They very, have a lot yes. of variety. Yes, very creative. And, and, and the culture cases, really helps there because, you know, they want to represent the Aztec culture with a lot of icons that can be used for this kind of things as well. Yeah. 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 So. Yep. Mm -hmm. I noticed that one of them says Correa Aereo by Air Mail, which is redundant. <laughs> it's the same thing, right? That's right. Yeah, it's Air Mail by Air Mail. Yeah. Yeah. Although in some countries they used to sell the air mail service, but wasn't one hundred percent air mail, and in some cases not even the first air mail in Peru was a combination. It was railroad all the way up to the Andes, overland, 
to the other side of the Andes and they, they catch the hydroplane that was the only airmail part of the trip. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard of some countries that they sell airmail service, but in reality went by train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I... Well, it, yeah, part of the problem in Switzerland in the, for the early, early airmail period is their trains were faster than the airmail. That's right. So, <laughs> and they did not fly, or maybe they did. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. They only flew like uh, seven or eight months of the year. That's right. <laughs> All right. Mauricio. Uh, uh, thank you, Gary, for this very interesting presentation and for showing uh, Honduran covers. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting fact on the second one, the fake uh, Honduran cover. Yeah. The 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 place in Honduras that they are mentioning on that label printed on the left, mm -hmm. I just check it up, and there are actually two places in Honduras with that name, and which are tiny and remote uh, towns. Uh, the the only La Unión that is actually important in Central America is it actually in in El Salvador, which is a port. So it's very interesting to see that fake cover. Um, what was the idea of doing that? I, I don't know, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, even, um, is that cover uh, old, uh, Gary, or is it? No, it's, it's fairly recent, probably from the, I'd have to check on the stamp, but probably from the 90s. Yeah, because the, the, the stamp used, the, the, the printed stamp, the, the, the fake Honduran, well, it's the reproduction of the Honduran stamp. Mm -hmm. I believe it is from a 1980s issue. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting to see. And yeah. uh, in, in my country, um, yeah, we, we, most of our covers are actually, airmail covers are uh, red, white, and blue because we copied the US covers. Um, those were the first like, actual airmail covers that we received. And our cover should have been um, blue and white for our um, right. flag, but we decided to use the red, white, and blue pattern because that, that's the one that we copied from yeah. the US covers. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Any other question for Gary? Paul. Yes, Gary, thank you for the presentation. This is a new term for me. Very well sorted and every, every, very good explained. Um, maybe I missed something, but I didn't see some cars from Ecuador. I am from Ecuador. We're a small country where a lot of mail by air in, the, in those years. So did you, did you check it out about these talks from Ecuador or you want me to send you some, some, send some, me some. copies? Absolutely, send me some. Yeah, a lot of countries I might have one or two covers from, or none. Um, it just depends on, on what the library gets and what I've found on eBay. So, yeah, by absolutely send me some covers. I'd appreciate it. Excellent. I will, I will do that. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. So, Gary, on that talking from the Denver point of view, and you getting a lot more of U.S. covers, what are the countries you are really seen more difficult for you to find? Um, more difficult. Uh, the, the British colonies in South America. Okay. I don't think I have any covers from, from those. I or think the I French do. Guiana. I don't think I have any covers from there. Okay. Um, some of the islands. I don't have any Puerto Rico covers, which is surprising to me. I have several from Cuba. Uh, but none from Puerto Rico. I have uh, at least one Dominican Republic cover. Um, uh, some of the countries in Africa, I don't have any covers for. Uh, uh, some that I got a, a, a while back, a few months ago, I got a stack of covers from, that came actually from missionaries in Africa that were sending mm -hmm. something back to somebody in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were they were you know from from Ivory Coast and other other countries I didn't have but okay yeah yeah some of the smaller countries I think yeah. I have covers from most of the European countries obviously and and Russia and a lot of the Eastern European countries but uh, yeah okay but I'm always on the lookout uh, 
Sure. Like I said, I I still find coverage from Mexico, even though I have 150 of them or so. I still find new covers from Mexico even. So. Right. Well, a lot of manufacturers over mm -hmm. there, so they will give their own little twist to, uh -huh. to the same thing. Yeah. Right. Luis Fernando. Yes, thank you. Nice presentation, Gary. Thank you. I wonder if you can show again your Honduras map cover, the back of. Sure. I, I, I thought I, that that may be a security uh, envelope. So they print the map, so you make it more private, like creating a privacy envelope. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a lot of them used, uh, they printed on the inside to make it secure. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they did the map on the outside. Let's see. Wait a minute. I'm not sharing yet. And Have that is not an advertisement. map on, on covers? What am I doing here? Where am I doing here? Gary? Yeah. Have you seen any other maps on, on covers? No, not on the outside. Just like I said, I showed one from the inside. Yeah, I got the same you, you showed, on the, on the one on the inside. Yeah, but no, that's I, I, this is the only one I've ever seen on the outside. I, I wanted to see this one because I got some from Guatemala, which is quite, quite the same, but with a official legend on. Hmm. I'm, I'm going to send you a copy of, okay. I'm going to yeah. put it on the, on, the, on the... Yeah, please do. Please do. Is the map so, accurate? Yeah, I've got that map. Actually, let's see, the map is kind of accurate. Yes, maybe the internal uh, division, the internal, yeah, of each of our, our departments or states, if you wish to call them, maybe are not as they should be drawn, but the outside borders, they look kind of okay. Um, what, one of my explanations to, to Gary regarding this cover is for the date it was mailed. Um, usually we didn't see any red covers in Honduras uh, until that time. The, that was during the government of Dr. Villela Morales of the Liberal Party, and the colors of the Liberal Party are red and white. And here, as many in our, in our countries, when one party is ruling, it, everything had to be according to that political party. And then when they switch parties, they switch all of the stuff. So that could explain uh, this, like showing things in red and white and the flag of the country could have had a political connotation for the time on when the, that envelope um, was used because there was a lot of, let's say, uh, political um, representation on that era. Even there are some postmarks, uh, like um, propaganda postmarks that were made in red because it was something about the Partido Liberal and uh, the National Party, which is the, the opposite, is blue and they print their stuff in blue. So that could explain something in Honduras of why they print the map in red and they wanted to show maybe a political, give a political connotation to this. That's a possible explanation uh, because yeah. it's not common to see uh, the Honduran map on, a, on an envelope. Yeah, yeah, like I said, the only one I've ever seen. The only other map I've seen is the next one from Uruguay. Um, but again, it's it's not nearly as, as pretty as the Honduran one. Henry, mm -hmm. I got the Guatemalan here. Can I share? A, sure. A screen with? Okay. Okay. Now, is the one at the bottom? There are two copies. One of the front and the back of the same envelope. I got, in fact, two envelopes, two covers. This another well, the bo and the bottom's it? got got birds on it too, doesn't it? Is the the oh, Guatemalan one? Yeah. The front is the one which is actually in the back is a Pan American 
mm -hmm. cover. But the, the very interesting thing in here is that the, the red the red reading there says this cover has been approved by the post office of Guatemala, uh, the, the general direction of post of Guatemala to be used exclusively in, in, in airmail. Fernando, ¿puedes hacerle aumento a, a la imagen para que la apreciemos mejor? Voy a, a ver cómo le hago aumento. Ah, ah, allá, arriba arriba está, allá arriba está la lupa. Ahí. Tengo ahora, mucho aumento, voy a quitarle un poquito. Sí. Y un poquito más. Y otro poquito. Ahí. Ahí, cheque, cheque. Is this promoting coffee? Sorry? Is the, the text below the map, is it uh, promoting coffee? It's, it's promoting coffee, yes. Yeah, okay. In my coffee, co in my coffee exhibit. Oh, okay. I have a cover I'll send you um, that used coffee beans to obfuscate the, the contents of the envelope. Oh, uh, probably uh, an African one? Uh, no, it's from Brazil, I believe. Oh, yes. I got one from Africa, which is the inside is a uh, coffee. coffee. The, yeah, different... I, I think this one's from, from Brazil, but um, yeah, now, send me your address and I'll send you a copy of it. The reason why I use this in my, my coffee exhibit okay. is because it actually says that the coffee has been officially approved by the direction of the of the of, of, of the post office. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So, quick question on that: Do they really need to be approved, or is there a UPU regulation about what goes to the border or the images or anything like that, or it was just maybe a, a local thing? Uh, my belief is that it's just a fancy thing. Okay, something local, right? There is no regulation in that. Yeah, but but see, Henry, this makes it valuable for, for thematic exhibit. Yes, because it's sanctioned because by the post office. Because you why you're using yeah. it. Right. Good, any other question for Gary or comments out there? I want to share with Gary one, one Honduran cover. It, it has no maps, sorry for that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, interesting enough. Let me just see if I can find my, it's, and also, and I will also show you a British Guyana cover that I have. Oh. I will send you the scans for that later okay. on. Actually, let's start with a British Guyana one. Uh, a British Guyana airmail cover. Uh, and someday in the future, he will send you the actual cover. Here you yeah. go. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> Let's see, wait, my internet is a little bit slow today. I do apologize. Uh, well, 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 the image gets uploaded, the, okay, here it comes, the British Guiana cover. Okay. It's, it's for a first flight, uh, but it, it is marked um, uh, red, white, and blue and the first air, first air mail um, legend, uh, text, I should say. Okay, that's one. So this went, this went from British Guiana to Honduras? Yes. Seems like, it, seems it, like it a pretty stopped good. at every, at, at, yeah, it stopped at Fair. every town between, yeah, uh, between British Guiana and, and, and first Honduras. Flight. It stopped, yeah, it stopped everywhere uh, over North, South America, and Central America. It, it stopped mm -hmm. everywhere. But it made it, yeah. Um, let me stop sharing this one. Uh, the the back actually, it's it just has the receiver mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Honduras, yeah. 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 Well, let me share you the other one. Um, just let me find it. The other one, the interesting uh, part, interesting thing is, um, actually, this is a U.S. cover, I believe. Let me. U.S. and oh no, sorry, this is a German one. Okay, 
I will show you this German also because it oh, has wow. the, the chevrons and it has the 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 airmail uh, etiquette printed and it also uh -huh. has a nice printed of the the Zeppelin in a Lufthansa airplane. I'll, I'll also send you a scan of, of this one. Uh, yeah, that's a beautiful cover. Right. Okay. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, the back only has the, the chevrons, I believe. Yeah, the back only has the, the, yeah. the parallel. The receiving. Yeah. And the receiving, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the third one I will show you. Just give me a moment. Okay, this, here it is. This one is a little bit interesting because I, I have never seen a draw a pattern similar to this one that I will show you. Um, this uh, parallel lines on just uh, two sides of the of the cover. Yeah, I, I don't, I, right now I don't have the reverse from this, but if uh, I do have the cover with me and actually it's printed in the US. So we bought a lot of our covers from the US. So we got what the US produced and we use them for, yeah. for airmail. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this one, you know, printed the etiquette in three languages. Yeah, but, it, but it, I have the cover with me and on the back there's a printer and the printer is, is in the US. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that one either. Okay, I'll send you a scan, so all yeah. three. Thank you. You're welcome. Any final question and comment? Okay, well, with that, Gary, thanks again for the nice presentation. We learned something today, and we'll send you some, some images. Hopefully, it will be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Y el día de mañana...